Hello everyone, and in today's video we are going to be covering over the Chrysler TV8, a concept tank that is more known for the fact that during its design there was a consideration to mount the tank with a nuclear powered engine for its main means of locomotion, making it a tank powered by nuclear energy. Which would raise some eyebrows in today's world, but during the 1950s there was a lot of interest in using nuclear reactors in powering vehicles due to the accelerating development and understanding of nuclear technology, to not only make nuclear ordnance, but also to power homes and vehicles. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's now talk on how the TV-8 came about. The history of the TPA started out in 1953, when the US military began Project Ashram. This project was an attempt by the US military to allow the various manufacturers to make a new tank design that was not bound by the usual restrictions usually placed on companies when designing new tanks. Usually when the military requests a new tank, there would often be quite a bit of requirements that the manufacturers has to follow which often meant that the companies were restricted on how radical their new designs could be. The goal of Project Ashron was to allow the various manufacturers to make new designs that wasn't bound by the usual restrictions. This project, however, still had the requirement that the companies selected had to at least have experience in producing tanks, and that they had the starting production date of 1958 at the very latest. This project however would end up amounting to little to no success, with none of the proposed designs make it past the drawing phase. One of the companies that took part in this, Chrysler, initially dropped out early on during Project Ashron, but later on they decided to have another crack at making a new tank design that would tackle some of the problems that was envisioned happening within a nuclear war and Chrysler would submit their proposal alongside Project Ashra. At the time, the problems that would have to be solved was that the tank would have to be able to survive a nuclear blast and the resulting after effects such as toxic chemicals and radiation that would be produced by the nuclear ordnance exploding, vaporising all matters of material that would be spread across the battlefield, posing a massive risk to unprotected personnel. To combat this particular problem would necessitate an NBC or Nuclear Biological and Chemical Protection System. The new tanks also had to be capable in dealing with other nations' modern tank designs, plus any bonuses if the new designs came with new systems or advances that would give it an edge in operational use. With these concerns in mind, Chrysler set about at making a new concept tank, that would be later known as a TV-8, which was very different from the usual tank designs of the 1950s like the M48 pattern. There would be a wooden mock-up of the TV-8 that would be produced, with one of the characteristics of the TV-8 that stick out the most would be its massive turret, as this turret was as wide and as long as the tank's hull, because this tank was designed with the intention of it being an amphibious tank. Within regards to the specification of the TV-8, there is very few details on the TV-8, as it was only a concept design, but the dimensions of the design would be around 8.9 meters in length, 3.4 meters in width, and a height of 2.92 meters. The other characteristics that are known is that it would be initially powered by a 300 horsepower Chrysler V8 gasoline engine located at the back of the turret. The speed was unknown, as there was no listed design speeds. Its main armament would be the T-208 smoothbore 19mm gun. The other weapons it included was two coaxial 7.62mm machine guns and one remote controlled 12.7mm heavy machine gun. Also on the design, there is no standard cupolas or fueling ports for the crew to peer through, as the tank would have a closed circuit TV system for officials to protect the crew from the flash of a nuclear explosion. 
though on the design papers there's no places for the cameras that were listed on the design drawings. The armour thickness of the turret isn't known, but the turret would be constructed with two shells, one inner and one outer shell. The inner shell would house all the vital parts, crew, gun, engine, whilst the outer shell would be constructed to give the tank the most surface area and buoyancy for it to cross over bodies of water as it was designed to be amphibious. And at the rear of the turret was a water jet pump to propel the tank through water. The outer shell would also help him prematurely detonate in heat rounds as heat loses its effectiveness if the form penetrator has to travel through air before penetrating the main plate. The turret shells was also heavily angled which would further improve the protection of the tank against heat ammo. However, to achieve the goal of the tank being amphibious, the tank would only weigh around 25 tonnes, with the turret taken up around 15 tonnes, and the remaining 10 tonnes being taken up by the hull, which would pose a problem with the design, which I would discuss later in the video. Now, with regards to the main power plant, the Chrysler gasoline engine was the first choice on the initial design, but during midway through the design, there was discussions on what other types of engines that could be utilised. One of the engines that was considered was a vapor cycled power plant fueled by hydrocarbons, which I have little to no clue on how it works, as the book that talks about it doesn't elaborate on how it exactly functions. The other engines that was considered was a gas turbine, with the final other engine that was considered that would surround the mythology of the TV-8, a nuclear fusion reactor that powered a vapor cycle power plant. But this latter option in particular would be the most unsuitable for the TV-8. With regards to the nuclear powered engine choice, there would be several problems that would be near impossible to solve. One of the key ones is that you would require a large team of specialised engineers, mechanics and other personnel trained to service the engine safely, which in itself would be both expensive to both manufacture and to keep him running order on the battlefield, which would see the reduced cost benefits of needing to transport oil be quickly replaced with even bigger logistics and maintenance support networks to service the tanks. Not only that, if the engine encountered any problems, the tank would be put out of commission for even longer than the standard gasoline-powered tank, as the fuel might need to be removed and stored into specialised containers if the engine needed to be worked on or fixed. And you would also have to deal with the risk of radiation poisoning to the crew, as being so close to the reactor with insufficient shielding will lead to the degrading health of the crew, unless they are continuously rotated out, which means that the tank would be continuously crewed by inexperienced crew members. These problems were discussed during the meeting at Chrysler, and the nuclear power plant was dropped due to the aforementioned problems. Another problem that plagued the TV-8 was the main armament. The T-208 main gun during its firing test was not performing as expected. The penetration, whilst being okay enough to deal with the current Soviet tanks like a T-54, was suffering from extremely poor dispersion that was often lacklustre beyond medium ranges, and proved no improvement compared to the other guns that were being fielded at the time, like the M41 90mm gun mounted on the M48 pattern tank. But these problems with the TV-8 led to a series of decisions by the military once they considered it along with the other proposals from Project Ashram, and it was deemed that none of these new designs had any significant advantage over the more standard tank designs that were being currently fielded. And so on the 23rd of April 1956, all of Project Ashram projects, including the TV-8, was cancelled. Now, the TV-8, in all likelihood, had it not been cancelled, would have most certainly not been produced at all, 
especially with the nuclear powered engine. Partly due to the previously mentioned problems with this type of power plant, there would also be other problems that would plague the design if it was to operate on the battlefield. First, the turret would be the biggest one, as the disproportionate weight between the turret and the hull would make the vehicle rather unstable and perhaps prone to rolling over if it was to travel up the side of the hill. Another problem would be the obvious weakness of the main connections that connect the turret to the hull. Unless this is extremely well protected, it would be one of the biggest central weaknesses that could outright cripple the tank in a single shot or a close blast from an artillery shell. Not only that, the size of the turret was also quite large, which isn't exactly good for keeping your tank hidden. Not only that, there was also a few other problems with the turret. Namely, by virtue of the turret being so big, meant that the armour of the turret would have to be paper thin in order to allow it to be amphibious. Plus, there would be also another problem of trying to get the crew into the tank itself. With the only decent place for the crew to enter into the tank would be on top of the turret. But the only real way of getting on top of the extremely well angled turret would be via the back of the turret as it was more flatter there. Which just so happens to be where the engine was mounted and had it been a nuclear reactor engine that was equipped then you can expect the crew members to get a good old dose of radiation poisoning each time they enter their vehicle. Another problem with nuclear power plant is that had it been equipped on the tank and was damaged by a round, the crew would at the very least be exposed to nuclear material that would be leaking from the engine and at worst if the TVA gun ammo was to detonate via a misfire or any rounds, then it would not only blow up the tank causing death to the crew but also spreading the nuclear material around the battlefield. This explosion luckily would not be as big as what some in the media portray as nuclear reactors operate in a different way to how an atomic bomb works as the nuclear fuel in the reactor would be heavily diluted as you want a controlled generation of energy to last over a long time rather than an uncontrolled generation of NG within a few seconds as if you would want for an atomic bomb. With regards to all the mentioned problems, it would not be out of the realm to see it outright cancelled had it not been for Project Ashron. And the concept of a nuclear powered tank since then has not been tried any further, at least within regards to the United States, as the problems with having a nuclear reactor in close proximity to living crew members will be a detriment to your fighting force before you even get to the front lines and it would do more damage than the enemy could in the war of attrition. Perhaps in the future the concept would be revisited if a breakthrough with regards to nuclear shielding is made but that is all for now. Thanks for watching now if you like this video please like and subscribe to the channel so that you will get notified when my next video goes live. Also, there is links to my Rumble, Odyssey, Mines, BitChute and YouTube channel in the description down below. So, I hope you all have a good day and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.